I'm Ryan Nidell, host of 15 Minutes of Freedom, your daily action guide to getting shit done. Today, I have an incredibly special guest on the show, someone that I actually remember watching from the stage here in Columbus, Ohio, the Arnold Classic, someone that has debunked the fitness industry myths that go on and has a thriving business of her own now, Felicia Romero. Felicia, say, say hello to everybody. Hey, everybody. Thanks so much for having me on, Ryan. I'm really excited. It is truly my pleasure. And w- when I say it's my pleasure, to see what you have went through and this transformation of literally competing for what, seven, eight, nine years on a professional stage, not even including the amateur ranks. I'm sure you were part of it for at least a year, right? Right. right. Yeah. To go from that, from being what top five in the Olympia, kind of the Super Bowl of bodybuilding, you know, win after win after win. I mean, great career right? into a destroyed body, really like a, a great physical. I mean, I say this with appropriate nature, of course, but from mm-hmm. the outside, you looked peak condition, like mm-hmm. very in shape, very put together. Mm-hmm. But then all of a sudden we've, you found out there were some things not going so right. Is that a good way to say it? Like, can you walk yeah. us through that? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You know, my story started out as very unique because I started competing because I've always been an athlete, went to Arizona State, played softball at Arizona State. I just love the aspect of a goal competing towards something. So, you know, for me, I sort of had that, um, that frame, that body work frame where I was at the gym and had, people were like, hey, you should really compete. And this was like back in 2004, 2005. I was like, okay. And figure was relatively new. I was a figure competitor. It was far before the bikini was introduced. So, um, I, it was like maybe three years that figure was introduced. So I was like, you know what? Okay, I'm going to give this a try. So my very first show, I actually trained myself. I researched online on bodybuilding.com, like how to diet for a bodybuilding show. I, of course, I probably did it all wrong. I didn't put salt on anything. I was boiled chicken. Like, like think of old school bodybuilding techniques. That's what I did for many years. And um, so I ended up placing third at my very first show here in Arizona And I was hooked. I mean, the process was grueling for me because I've never dieted before. I came from a Mexican background. We kind of ate when, you know, ate whatever, you know, I was always active though. So I never really had like a weight problem. So, you know, my story is unique mainly because I turned pro at my very first national show. So a year later decided to actually hire a coach at that point go to the USA's, I turned pro at the very first national show. I had no idea what I was in for. I had no idea what a pro was. I just did it because I like to compete. And I was kind of thrown into the modeling ranks. You know, at that time, I was scouted for Muscle and Fitness Hers right in the lobby after I won my pro card. I was shooting for a cover a week later. So again, my story is very unique. I'm a firm believer in, you know, action. Action creates momentum, creates opportunity. So for me, I took that action. It created all these amazing opportunities right place at the right time. So fast forward to, you know, nine years later, I had competed, gosh, six years in the Olympia, um, four or five years at the Arnold Figure International, um, worked my way up to, you know, at one point top four in the world at what I did. And it was, uh, it was lots of pressure I put on myself, but it was also a whirlwind, you know, and I didn't realize that all those years of extreme dieting. So literally you think, really get ready for a show, get in the best shape of your life. Immediately after that show, I started to binge eat and that would just go on and on. So just think of that vicious cycle of dieting, binge eating, dieting, binge eating. By the end of all of that, my body, my metabolism, my thyroid, my hormones were completely destroyed. And towards the end of my career, I was actually forced to to stop because my body just was not responding to anything anymore. And at that point, you know, I was like, okay, I, I have to stop. Yeah. Yeah. And in that, so you stop and there's, I don't say an identity crisis because I don't know that that's fair, but for me, you've associated with this fitness world now for years and years, you know, like you said, top four in the world, mm-hmm. widely recognizable cover after cover after cover. Right. And then there's a shift cause you can't do it anymore. Right. Like, right. So, yeah. so how's that work? Like, for, for those of you that don't know, Felicia is also an incredible motivational speaker. Like her story is widespread and wide known. She, she's just got back from a conference last weekend. Like she's, she's on the road. So this story, there's a lot to be gained out of this more than just fitness. Like this is, this is a much bigger platform. Absolutely. And I think men and women, you know, in that world, whatever you identify yourself with, like for me, I define myself by the stage. I was always getting ready for for a competition. And those were all the questions that were asked to me. Oh, what competition are you getting ready for? Oh, you look great. 
And I thrived on that. I think, you know, part of that fitness world is that little bit of vanity and narcissism, unfortunately. And I'm just being honest, you know, I was so used to looking a certain way. I was used to people, you know, giving me that attention like, oh, what are you getting ready for? Oh, good job. And then I, I had to keep winning. I had to keep competing. And when that came to a halt, when I wasn't able to get in shape anymore and my body was not responding, um, it was really difficult for me because I defined myself by that status, by that stage, by that body. And for me, you know, when I didn't look like at the end of the day, the person that was on the cover of that magazine and I was, you know, 40 pounds overweight and health issues, that was really hard for me. I was, I was embarrassed. I was ashamed. I didn't want people to see me. And that was before I quit around the time social media started to become really big. You know, my, my last show was in 2012. So um, that's when I really, you know, the social media started to pick up. So for me, it was really difficult because it was like that whole, you know, Brett Favre story. Brett Favre can't retire. He just kind of holds on to that football. I just, I couldn't let go. And when I did, it was, it took me a year to kind of transition. Yeah, that, that's incredible. And, and through that time, Felicia, do you have the same coach the entire time you were pro or do you have a couple different coaches throughout that time? Yeah, um, that's a good question. I had a couple different coaches. When I first started out, I trained with Kim Odo um, okay. and he kind of got me in the mix, you know, as far as like, you know, the pro introduced me to the right people and started coming up and through the ranks. Um, by the end of my career, I think I had like six pro wins. Um, and so, but towards the end of my career, I actually started dating my coach um and uh, he's he's well known in the industry now and i will not say his name because it's one of those things where i'm like it's one of those things that it's in the past but for me you know when you're dating your coach that isn't always the best because they sort of you know he probably he already has sort of a controlling aspect to him so not only was he controlling what i ate and what i did but also you know in the relationship aspect controlling you know my schedule and um, when I trained and when I went to sleep. And so it was all so consuming. Mm -hmm. um, but for me at that time, I think, you know, and I, I'm a firm believer and we all go through things for a reason. I think I went through that because I needed to go through that. Um, for some reason, I attracted men like that um, in my life who controlled me or, you know, wanted that control. But also, too, I stemmed back to like my dad wasn't in the picture for many years. You know, he left when I was 10. So I attracted those sorts of men, unfortunately. And I was single for seven years after that whole situation. He was cheating on me. It was a horrible situation, um, which again, I think a lot of my health issues stemmed from some of that trauma, but also a lot of my food issues stemmed for that trauma. And this is, oh my God, I can't believe I'm talking about this. This is so crazy. But I love this. I remember a time when I, okay, so my binge eating started around the time that we started dating and we moved in together. So he controlled everything that I ate, right? So I remember getting up in the middle of the night at like one or two in the morning and totally binge eating like peanut butter and almond butter with chocolate and just like, because he judged what I ate, obviously. And so I couldn't eat that in front of him. So at night I would wake up, he was asleep and I would eat. And I think that's when my night eating, my binge eating really started to take a turn. Um, Cause it used to just be post competition now it started to be sometimes during my training, um, you know, during the off season. And that's when it got really bad. Yeah. And, and I mean, it's incredible. You touch base on some of those early developmental childhood traumas. Yeah. And I, that's what, so I have a, I'll call it a coaching business, personal development, life, life optimization, probably a lot similar to what maybe what, what you offer in some capacity. I have this, this theory that's proven over and over again, that when you go back to those developmental years, I'm really like four to 12 the traumas and the original incidents that happened then form this negative feedback loop that we, until we're aware of it, it just seems like it keeps manifesting itself again in our adulthood. Mm -hmm. And most of us never go back and take those extra, you know, painful hours. I mean, it's not yeah. quick and easy, but to really think of like, yeah. not that you were met, we all have our own level of trauma. And I'm not saying that your father leaving you was easy or hard. That's your right. cross to bear. But to be so aware of the fact that that happened and then the loops and the, the patterns that have existed in your life based off that, Right. That's nuts. So were there original food issues? I mean, wherever, I mean, obviously coming from that, you know, Mexican background, yeah. Spanish background that right. you had been, I'm sure you had to have large meals, right? I mean, from the way I view that culture, yeah. forgive me if I'm wrong, was right. there ever a right. history of, you know, unique eating patterns back then or was it? 
Honestly, there wasn't. Um, there wasn't a lot of food issues when I was young. I was really active. I also knew my cues. Like I stopped eating when I was full. I ate when I was hungry. I, I could understand my hunger cues and I could stop, you know, like stop and start whenever I wanted. It wasn't until as an adult is when I really started to develop those issues. Um, and the the mindset towards food and the deprivation and the not allowing to eat this sort of thing and then it just started to trigger all of this like oh like you literally couldn't get a dozen cookies in front of me like if i was home alone okay home alone and there was a dozen cookies there sugar cookies my favorite cookie with with frosting i would eat the whole dozen in one sitting like there was no questions asked even if i told myself i'm gonna buy these i'm only gonna have one i'm gonna be good um nope for whatever reason, something would trigger in my brain when I would have that first initial cookie to where I got to eat the whole dozen and get it out of the house. And I'm not going to do this again until three days later and I would do it again and binge eat. And it was just this constant struggle. So for whatever reason, it was this trigger of like, I was never going to get it again. And so I had to eat it all now. Um, and I, I think there's probably more to that than just the food itself. There was probably something inside, something mental, something, you know, going on there. But yeah, it was, it got pretty severe. That's, that's so incredible. But in that, Felicia, you figured out how to recalibrate your thyroid, right? I mean, you've, you've went from taking this impactful moment in life that could have defined a whole different reality for you and went down this, I don't want to call it obesity, because but, you know, you could have taken a different path, but instead you focused and fixed it. And now you offer that to other people, right? Yeah, absolutely. And I always say this when I talk about this, when I, when I talk about my story, you know, I feel like I came out of the industry alive because a lot of people get sucked in and um, are not able to get themselves out. Or when they do come out, they're kind of lost, you know, whether it's again, 40 pounds at my heaviest, I was 165 pounds after my competition. And I would step on stage at like 115. So that was a huge disparity of weight there, um, of bloat and weight and just not feeling comfortable in my skin. So, um, and some people live there and stay there and not able to heal themselves. So I'm so thankful that I took the time, the process, the, the mental work, the growth to really get to that point. Um, and it took a lot of time, but the thyroid did heal, my metabolism healed, and um, I'm so much better for it. And now that I can, now I can help others get through that as well. Yes. And you seem like almost a glutton for punishment because not only did you compete and then stop competing, gain some weight, yeah, <laughs> reset your metabolism, but then you went like full fledged fit to fat to fit, <laughs> you know, life, lifestyle, reality TV show. Walk right. through that. Like how, how, what was that even mentally? Like when someone calls you up and says, Hey, I want you on a show or how, how did that even come into your life? I don't know if somebody called you or what happened, but you, you, yeah. you, you had to put on weight to take weight off. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. It sounds crazy. I know. I'm like, okay, what was I thinking? But no, yeah, I'll take you to the, through the story of how that happened. Um, so back in like 2000, I believe 2016, I was approached by a casting agent saying, Hey, we have this reality show and you know, we're looking to cast, um, some trainers for the show. Um, the premise of the show is that, you know, they kind of gave me the backstory, like, Hey, you got to put on weight for your client then you guys take it off together. So basically you're the trainers putting yourself in the shoes of your client and then you take it off. And at first I was like, absolutely not. I have put myself, my health through so much through the years. I'm finally to a point where I've healed. I was healthy again. I was off thyroid medication at that point. I had a good relationship with food. I felt great. I was active. I was on a good routine. And I was like, God, I don't know if I want to put myself through that again. Mm -hmm. So initially, I, I sort of uh, said, hey, let me think about it. It wasn't a clear yes, but it wasn't a clear no. And then, um, you know, a couple weeks passed, they contacted me again and said, hey, you know, we're looking to cast. Um, but also, we changed a little bit uh, the premise of the show where the client is not some person you don't know. It's the client is actually going to be someone you know and love. Um, it could be a family member. It could be a good friend. It could be, you know, anything. And I was like, wow, they're like, do you have anyone in your life that is suffering from obesity or overweight? And I said, yeah, my, my sister, you know, and she was at that point, 240 pounds, you know, and she is my height. So she's hundred, she's gained a hundred pounds over the course of the last five years. And so at that point, it changed the game for me um, because I thought, you know, if I could help her, I've always tried to help her through the years. And of course you think family, they just don't listen, you know? And I was like, you know what? I can do this and I want to do this for her. 
So that was my breaking point saying, hey, your sister's going to do this with you. So then she was casted. Then we flew out to LA and we filmed that first initial, you know, intro show um, with Drew Manning. He was the creator of Fit to Fat to Fit. He, he was on Dr. Oz and all of these awesome shows talking about this experience. And then there we went and it was eight months of filming. And so from initial phone call, how much weight did you put on before you got to start taking weight off? Like what, what was, and it was it back to the binge eating again? Did you do it more slow and controlled? How do you, yeah, how do you that put was, on that weight? That is a good question. That was the, I didn't realize and nor would anyone believe me, but it was hard for me to put on weight. And I had a huge metabolism. I had to literally, it was a pure gluttony. I had to overeat every day, all day, adopt the habits of my sister, which she was eating fast food, soda. The soda was really difficult for me because it would give me a lot of heartburn. So I didn't have that as much. Um, so the first two months, I remember the first eight weeks, I only put on about 12 pounds and the production team, the producers were like, this isn't cutting it. You need to put on weight. Like, are you eating? I, at that point, I had to like document all of my meals because they didn't believe that I was eating. And it was like, so difficult. At that point, I brought in a nutritionist and we were trying to like do it strategically at that point. So before it was just like, oh, I'll eat junk food, gain weight. Well, that wasn't happening. I was not gaining weight. I was putting on body fat. My stomach was growing, but the weight just wasn't coming on. They wanted to see that weight on the scale. So then I brought in a nutritionist and then I started getting strategic about it. You know, um, as far as like the amount of calories that I was eating, the types of calories, the amount of food. Um, by the end of it, I had put on about 28 pounds. Um, I looked different. You could physically see my body, like my stomach had grown. I looked like I was probably five months pregnant. My thighs grew. Um, my face was bloated. Uh, I had really bad skin. My, my, I started getting really bad breakouts. And the biggest transition for me wasn't even the body. Like I almost, it was weird to kind of come to this like self-acceptance, like, oh, this is for a short period of time. I know that I'm going to lose this weight. Um, it was the mental piece. Um, I was so depressed, so anxious. It brought me back to where I was years before post-competing when I didn't want to leave the house. I had social anxiety. I was unmotivated. I was like panicky a lot of the times, like anxious. Um, and you know, food and the lack of exercise caused a lot of that, but it was the weirdest thing because I was actually okay with my physical weight and my gaining of the weight and the way that I looked. Um, and I'll send you photos of, of my before afters, but it was the mental aspect. So that was the most surprising to me. Yeah. So I'm going to put you on the spot for a second. I don't like to do this, but I feel, I feel called to. Yes. If, if someone right now, inevitably, I know one of my listeners is living their life the way that you've described your sister was living. Not saying she still is with the soda right. and the fast food and the lack of self-confidence and the lack of energy and the mental anguish. If you right. offer a tip or two to a listener to get them to start to make a shift, an impactful shift, mm -hmm. what, would, what would your top two or three like go to? I would have my client do this. What does that look like for you? And more importantly, after that, I'm okay with this. Right. Well, plug like you offer training, like you've created a whole okay. digital platform. You you help people yeah. heal their thyroids. Like your business story is this whole other part we're going to get into. But yeah. there's so much depth to you. Like this is not for, for you listening. And I say this again with complete uh, appropriateness. I want to phrase it that way. Felicia was was and is a beautiful person on the inside and out who was paid to be a model on the front of magazines, mm -hmm. who had then grown a very successful gym in Arizona, got tired of being handicapped, as funny as that sounds, by a brick and mortar business and wanted to take her knowledge and expand it to a bigger pool of people. And you can't do that with a brick and mortar in today's world. So she's created this whole incredible digital platform with an app and things to download. And Felicia, let everybody know at some point here how they get a hold of you. Like yeah. this is normal for me. Like this is, it'd be different if you're, and I say this laughingly, if you're just a pretty face, then like, okay, Screw right. it. Like we would, we wouldn't talk about this, but you offer right. incredible substance and are proof positive of what you know works. Thank you. Thank you so Welcome. much. Again, my story is a true story of my passion leading to my purpose. And that truly is before it all, before the competitions, before the magazines, before the reality shows, I was helping people. You know, I have my master's in exercise and wellness from Arizona state. So I love helping people and that's a true call to my passion. Um, but yeah, absolutely. I have an online training program where I help people 
all around the nation, um, get into the best shapes of their lives by not necessarily adopting to those diet rules, but more of the lifestyle, everything that I've gone through to sort of um, obviously get through that time. But for you, like you'd said, some of the first, I would say, um, helpful tips that I would give those people that want to get started is first and foremost, have a clear cut write down what it is that you want to accomplish, put it out into the universe, have intentions of what you're going to do and write it down, whether whatever goal that might be, if your goal is to, you know, and I always um, kind of like to go on the side of like, um, not necessarily number scale or weight scale or body fat scale, but more on the scale of like, you want to be stronger, you want to fit into these, you know, size four jeans, or you want to be able to run around with your kids, write that down, because that's a lot more manageable than like, I want to fit into this mold of 120 pounds, which you may look fantastic at 130 pounds. But because you can't get into the 120s, then you, you feel like a failure. You know, that's why for me, I always try to base it on something else. So yeah, I always say write down your goals and write down your intentions first and foremost, because that is the most important thing. That is the most, get it clear about what it is that you want to do. I love that. I love that. And from, from also like our pre-show interview and also what I know about you, you, you love like the metaphysic, like, you know, between meditation and speaking things in the universe and the power of positive thinking and affirmations. Like that's part of who you are, right? I'm not, I'm not misreading that. I, oh, absolutely. I feel this, and I, it's, I know it sounds cliche, but I started writing my goals down last year, and this is the power of putting it out into the universe. And I'm going to throw some numbers at you, um, some different things, and I'm not, you know, I'm not ashamed of, you know, putting a financial number out there or things like that, but I think it's, it's, it's good to put it in terms of like what your goal is and what you set out to do. So for me last year, January of last year, I started writing down my goals, my top five goals. Number one was a financial goal. I wanted to make a certain number, okay? And you always have to get specific with what you want. You can't just say, I wanna make more money. Well, okay, what does that mean? You gotta put it down on paper, a specific number. So for me, I put down 30,000. I wanna make 30,000 a month in what I do, in my training program, in what I do. Number two was, I wanna get another cover. Um, I had already at that point gotten seven covers. I had been out of that fitness modeling game, you know, a couple years and I was like, you know what? Who cares? I want to put it out there. I want to see if I can still do it a different point in my life. I'm not necessarily, I don't label myself as fitness model by any means, but Hey, I want to, I want to th throw that in the universe. Number three, I want to find my fun, my partner, my soulmate. I, I was ready. I want that relationship. Um, and I forget what number four, number five was, but I just know those top three because I'd write them down every single day within that year. So exactly a year from when I wrote that, um, that goal, I made my first 30,000 in one month, and that was this last year. Um, number two, I wanted to cover. I started writing that those goals down in January. By April of that year, this was last year, 2017, I got my eighth cover, putting it out into the universe, right? Number yes. three was find my soulmate, find my partner. And again, by May of that year, I found my partner. We're together now, high school sweethearts. We reconnected after 17 years. So I'm a firm believer in putting those goals out in the universe, writing it down, seeing it every day, believing it, feeling it, because it will happen. I, I was not financially secure at that time. You know, I, 30,000 felt like a million dollars to me, right? Yeah. I was like a handicap to my business. Like you said, I, you know, was always the last to get paid. I paid my employees, made the overhead, and I was always the last to get paid. And I was not financially secure. You know, I, on paper, you'd see this really successful person, but I wasn't, it wasn't really like showing that financially for me. Yeah. And I had a bunch of debt and all of that. So I was like, you know what, this is what I want. I want to work towards this. And I did it. And I've been able to pay off debt and I've been able to become financially secure in my own, in my own right. And just work towards that. And it's possible. You have to believe it, but you gotta, you gotta write it down. Well, and happy and glowing, like to think of how you would have, if you would have looked in the mirror, you know, December of 2016 and mm -hmm. look yourself in the eye versus how you look and feel now. Mm -hmm. like, when this, when this, when you're, when you as a listener see the, the social footage of this, like Felicia's just like glowing. Like it, she's, she's walking in her purpose, her passion. You know, she's, I think it's a horrible term, but living her best life. Like I always struggle with that. Like, how is this moment really my best life? I'm always working towards something better. Like sure, right. I'm the best moment right now. 
but it's that power of intention and setting that intention, not daily. Like I think that's one of the tough things for me personally, you know, you get that first part of January and everybody has new year's resolutions and I love it. Like, great. And you, you follow that for 10 or 14 days Mm -hmm. and then life gets in the way because your old habits come up, your old stories, your old belief systems, and you lose sight of the fact of like, no, in a now society, I don't know how to snap my fingers and find my soulmate or snap my fingers and make that $30,000. Like that takes time and energy and effort and consistency. But yeah. speaking of consistency, you have a pretty incredible morning routine, right? Like you have, a, you have some things that you recommend people do every morning too. Absolutely. I think it's so important the way you start your day. And the only reason I, I start this way now because I suffered from anxiety for years to where it was actually really difficult for me to get out of bed. I pushed the snooze button. I didn't want to face the day. I wanted to sleep. I didn't want to like literally face the day. And for me over the years, healing that mindset and healing my body and everything that goes along with that, you know, your morning routine and the the way you get started kind of sets the tone for the day. You know what I mean? So for me, I'm not necessarily an early bird riser. Like I used to be at, you know, four or five in the morning, but you know, I get at a reasonable hour between six and six 30. And, um, I really, I either listen to a podcast first and foremost, or I start, uh, I'd read a chapter in one of my favorite books or whatever I'm reading at that time. Um, I really try to stay off of social media right from the get go because, um, for me, I didn't, I don't necessarily want to start my day that way, but, um, I started in that habit. I told myself I wanted to get up a little earlier and I really wanted to get that momentum going for the day, whether it be gaining insight, knowledge, getting motivation from a podcast. Um, I think just knowing that and being positive about your day and knowing what you can do can definitely set the tone, not only for your day, but for your life. You know, um, I think a lot of times people walk around just purposeless. You know, they don't have a purpose and they're not really striving for anything. And for me being an entrepreneur and my own employer, I don't have a boss. I have to find that motivation and keep going. A lot of people ask me that, well, how do you stay motivated to do all these things? And I'm like, it's, it's not about motivation. It's literally just showing up. You got to show up each and every day, even when you don't feel like it. And that, that motivation will come. Yeah. So do you still do like, do you have a meditation practice? Are you still doing lemon water, some of that stuff to jumpstart the metabolism? Or are these? Yeah, absolutely. I I love apple cider vinegar and I actually recommend that to all my clients. Um, I had gut issues for years. So that's something that really helped my gut. Um, Definitely the meditation piece, whether it's five minutes or 15 minutes, I think it's important to kind of sit in that, write your intentions out for the day. Again, I'm all about intentions and goals. Um, and getting that going. I think that's so important. I know it sounds tedious and it sounds sort of like, you know, mundane, but it's something that honestly just can change your life. Absolutely. So in your meditation, so my listeners are super used to, so I have this morning routine. I get up at four 30 every morning. I meditate for 15 to 30 minutes. I then journal after that. I drink a green smoothie. I sweat a little bit. I read something. I then journal and apply what I read. And then I send notes or letters of appreciation to my daughter and my wife about things I love on or appreciate about them. I do all that from 4.30 in the morning to about 7 every day. Don't care where I'm at in the world. Like, that's my thing. That's so, right. But in that, how did you start meditation? Like, was that a, a practice of your life that had been there? Or was this, like, has it evolved? You're so close to Sedona, Arizona. I don't know if you've been there before or if you, you, you go up, like, Sedona is this breathtaking Sedona. Amazing. Yeah, amazing. Sedona is absolutely breathtaking. And it has all the vortexes, right? The energy. I'm all about yeah. healing uh, energy. Yes. I actually part of my healing process with my thyroid was Reiki energy healing. Um, yeah. So healing my throat chakra. So those of you out there that you know may not know Reiki, it's a form of energy healing. And a part of my healing process for the longest time, I was, you know, in a controlling relationship. So my voice wasn't being heard. I was I was not my true self. So my throat chakra, unfortunately, was compromised, which your throat chakra, that's where your thyroid's located. So I think, again, that trauma that I had in my life from that past abusive relationship um, affected my my chakras. And, you know, I had to let that go over the years. I had to heal that. I had to release those blocks in my life. And the blocks in your life are going to stay there unless you do something about it to remove them. And that comes from meditation. It comes from being self-aware. It comes from being mindful. Um, Absolutely. So meditation did not come easy for me because, like I said before, I was always an anxious person. So I'm always like, as I'm sitting there trying to meditate, okay, what do I got to do tomorrow? And, oh, you know, what am I going to do after this? So, oh, man, I got to do the laundry. I got to get this done. I got to do that. So 
I could never just calm my mind. So for me, it started out, I used to actually download um, like meditation apps because I didn't know how to do it on my own at first. So I would download a meditation app and I would listen to whether it's um, a word mantra or an affirmation like I am like um, I am powerful. Yeah. I am powerful. I am powerful. And I'd say it over and over again for a you know period of time. Um, or I'd listen to the, the meditation app. And then after a while, it got easier for me. And I was able to calm my mind and be in that place. But it wasn't easy. It didn't come easy at first. So if you want any sort of retreats or anything like that, like how, how far down this vortex, like Abraham and Esther Hicks style, like are we going like Dr. Joe Dispenza? As far as like ayahuasca, like how far down this path are, have you have you ventured, Felicia? Like this yeah. is super, like I love this stuff. Yeah, I love this stuff too. You know, this is what prompted me to sort of start making the transition in my life last year when I decided to sell my brick and mortar. Was uh, January of last year, 2017. I um, went to Thailand, and yeah, I, there was like um, part of it was vacation, part of it was like that meditation retreat. Um, and I just got complete insight on to where my life was going, what I wanted to do, what my intentions were and what truly made me happy at the end of the day and not what was making everyone else happy and what I would do to, for others to please people. Cause I'm a people pleaser. Oh. What makes Felicia happy? Who cares what people think at the end of the day? What is it that makes you happy? What, you know, motivates you? What makes you want to get up in the morning and get going with your day? And that was the call to action for me to say, you know what? I am not living my best life right now, my purpose. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the brick and mortar served its time. It served its purpose. And I'm thankful for that experience. But it was time for me to transition and move on. Yeah. And that's when I started to kind of make the active steps to get, you know, change my situation. Yeah. So that I have to ask, what is your stance on, I'll say plant medicine, like whether it's ayahuasca, whether it's mushrooms, like, and I'm not advocating drug use. Like I always preface this every time. Like, I think there's a part of our brain that is not tied into a universal force until we open that up. And maybe that's your right. meditation. Maybe it's your right. natural source. Like I'm not looking to sit here and pop mushrooms because I want to get high in my office. Like right. I'm, I'm asking selfishly because I'm on this precipice of wanting to go down that road but yeah. I haven't met people. I've, I've met plenty of people that have went down that path from like an Aubrey Marcus guys like that, that like yeah. are big advocates of it. Just right. what's your stance? Yeah, I would say, you know, it just depends on the person. Um, you know, I've read a lot about, it. I don't know if you've ever watched that YouTube special or that Chelsea Handler special where Chelsea Handler went down to, I don't know where it was, uh, Peru or somewhere. Yeah, Peru. And yep. And she, she basically took, and I don't even know the name of the drug she took, but it's, it's that Eastern, you know, what is it, that Native American, um, I don't know what it was, but she drank it. And basically, it's supposed to cleanse you. It's supposed to, you're going to kind of maybe have the hallucinogen, you know, hallucinogen and things like that. But I, I, I wouldn't say, I can't say that I would necessarily try it myself, but I'm not against it either. I think it's, it's, it's up to that person. It's up to the individual. Um, and... Yeah, I don't know. I, I guess I'm not sure of my stance on that. Um, I'm, I'm not against it by any means, but I think it just depends on the person. Yes, and I appreciate that feedback. So there's a, I, I'm a little bit maybe arrogant with this. Like I don't want to go stomp around the Brazilian jungle, or, or you know, I don't want to go to Peru and, and hang out in the yeah. forest anymore. So there's, yeah. <laughs> I'm not associated with them. I don't have some sort of affiliate agreement. But there's yeah. a place in Costa Rica called Rhythmia, and oh, Rhythmia, yes. yeah, this five star resort, super mm -hmm. super inclusive not mm -hmm. massively expensive, but they take you through this whole seven to 14 day journey of cleansing, cleansing your soul and, you know, literally farm to table food and getting ready for a medicine experience where I'm like, man, that just, it's called me for so long. And I've met some people and had some guests on the show that have been there before. I'm just like, there's something energetic. Like I know there's another place to open up my mind yeah. because the universe is telling me to go as, as funny I as I would that. definitely do that. I would definitely do that. I've actually seen my friend Drew Manning post about that. He's going to be doing that retreat again. Yeah. And that is something I completely open to because, you know, when you come, when you go through a level of, um, of growth and let's say you've been through, you know, a lot of turmoil, a lot of obstacles, a lot of ups and downs in your life, you, you kind of gain this insight. You learn from your mistakes, obviously, and I'm, I've made many. Mm -hmm. And you kind of, you grow from that, but you also learn to be very self-aware and mindful of that, you know, like wanting to grow and wanting to expand that mind and expand your experiences. And I think that's part of the experience of life, you know, the journey of life is to grow from that. So I absolutely would do something like that.
Yeah, I, I love it. I, I love it. I appreciate someone that it's open-minded and will share this stuff openly. Like start talking Reiki or like crystals. Like I literally have hematite that I typically hold in my hand as we're having yeah. conversation, just that truth. Yeah. And you know, I've yeah. got different crystals in my hand and feel vibrations and I'm all about that. It's just so foreign yeah. for most people. And it's, yeah, I, I carried around sodalite and yeah. sodalite known to um, cure or improve thyroid function. So, you know, when I was at my worst, worst, and, you know, the regular Western medicine was not working for me, I didn't want to jump on, you know, the doctors wanted to prescribe Xanax for my anxiety, and they wanted to give me the Synthroid for my thyroid and all of that, which I took, never took the Xanax, I wanted something, I knew that something was wrong inside, and I knew that I needed to heal it naturally, but um, I remember researching, you know, crystals and stones and things like that, so the sodalite has been known to help your thyroid. And so I would either have it on a necklace around my 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 um, my neck or I'd keep it in my pocket. Um, but I had it with me all the time. I love it. And you as you're listening right now, there's an inevitably a large percentage of you that thinks literally that I'm fucking crazy. Like I, I know there's, there's part of you. I'll challenge you to consider the fact of what do you have to lose by trying it? Like right. the crystal is going to cost you 20 or 30 bucks. If you put belief in it, even if it's a, a placebo, but you believe the placebo works and you get a benefit from it. Right. Why do you care? Like right. I, Felicia successful. I know plenty of successful people that also adopt the same sort of mindset. Actually probably no more successful people that think this way that operate this way than the mm -hmm. opposite. Like think about the people that you associate with. I like, bet right. if we, you, you touch base on it, like, I obviously, I know Drew not in the same capacity you do, but had conversation with him and like all right. these people are all somewhere in that same mm -hmm. mindset that are open to a possibility, Absolutely. not saying that it's the end all to be all, but there's a possibility that this stuff is actually doing something. Absolutely. And just take even just the, the meditation, which you talk about and intentions and writing things down and goals and journaling. If you, if you look at a most successful people um, and you see their habits and you learn about their habits that is included in their habits. Um, you know, a portion of their day or, you know, a small portion of their days, you know, um, they, they, they meditate, they journal, they write their goals, they write their intentions. And that's, I would say, the common thing among very, you know, successful people and things like that. So. Yeah, I love it. So to now, you know, bringing the conversation back into to a more palatable realm for most people. So you have this gym. Yes. You founded, you know, you, the gym was yours. Mm -hmm. you grew it successful member base mm -hmm. you started to feel trapped from what I understand right like you're, you're stuck literally in between those four walls you have a relationship that collapses you you find out some stuff that's not so healthy or happy about that you have your right. own little not I don't say little you have an identity crisis about the fitness world you have some body things going on and then you go on this retreat and you realize the gym's just not for you either right like kind of right. all at the same time in life Right. Absolutely. Yeah. It was just that turning point in my life, you know, to really, you can either continue what you're doing or really make the change. And for me, I wanted to make more of an impact. And I felt like having a gym, I only had that impact within that five mile radius. That was my biggest, I need to get, you know, more members and I need to, you know, attract all the people around the gym and things like that. And I had payroll and, and it just got so overly consuming, but it was also all the things that I didn't necessarily love. I didn't love the, you know, the micromanaging, the delegating, the um, hiring and firing, the, the business aspect, essentially. What I loved is helping people. And that's where I truly thrived, which is why I continue to kind of teach still at that time. Um, but, you know, even after that, I still had to kind of start moving out of like teaching classes because again, you know, seeing the bigger picture, I had to keep the business running. So um, I, that's when I finally made the decision that I, this is not making me happy anymore. I've had gyms for the better part of 10 years and I, I wanted to make that shift, um, which was one of the hardest things to do. Cause again, we all have that identity crisis. I identified myself. It's like I was only felt successful if I had a gym that I was running and that I owned and I'm like, what? Who cares what people think? You know, who cares what people think? I have to be happy at the end of the day. And this isn't about anybody else. This is about me and my happiness. So um, I made that, that that change. And I am so happy I did. You know, so happy I did. I have more freedom to spend with friends and family. Um, I was always busy before. I never had time to sit down at lunch with my mom and, and not be rushed out. Or um, I have more time with my loved ones, like my boyfriend and his little boy. Um, I have more time to take care of myself and do the things that I love to do, but also to do the things that, that I thrive on, which is helping people. You know, I created an online program. 
um, where I can help people nationwide. Right now I have about 75 clients and, and I can speak a lot more. I can travel and motivational speak about things that I'm passionate about. Um, so yeah, so I would say that was a great move and a great transition for me. Absolutely. And in, in Felicia, and in vein of discussing helping more people, are you able to take more clients right now through yeah. your platform? Yeah, I, just made a, I made a post the other day. I can probably take, I just, um, so people, it's a three month program. So, you know, every month, you know, whether um, so I get people that hit their goals, things like that, I usually kind of take on some more. So I have like two to three openings right now. And you can basically contact me through Instagram. I have an in, uh, intake form on my link. Just click on that and you fill out the paperwork and we get on a phone call. And what is your Instagram handle? So everybody knows it. Yes, my Instagram handle is just my name. So it's at Felicia Romero, F-E-L-I-C-I-A Romero, R-O-M-E-R-O. Wonderful. And is your thyroid recalibration system yeah. there as well? Everything's on the same, same place? Yes, it's right there. The thyroid reboot. And the awesome thing about the thyroid reboot program is literally I go through that program, everything that I did to heal myself. And that includes not only the nutrition piece, the workout piece, but also the energy healing piece. Um, I did the Reiki, um, uh, acupuncture, all of the things that might seem a little bit outlandish, but I know is awesome and it works, is right in there. And uh, I help people through that. So I love it. I love it. But I love something more. And that's the, the relationship side of things. So yeah. you touch base that you have now a thriving relationship. You guys live together. Your boyfriend has a son that's young. Mm hmm walk through some of that dynamic. Cause again, you, listeners know obviously I'm, I'm married, have a, what I'll call a bonus daughter. I get all these fun things. And they've heard the male perspective of this, but you get to be, you know, the, the bonus mom really. It, yeah, it's, it's, I love that word bonus. You know, yeah, I think, I think I didn't even really know. Yeah, I didn't even really know how to refer to myself. Like, am I a step parent? Like, I don't. I kind of even felt kind of icky saying step parent. Um, I don't even know. I, I, it's a bonus. That's amazing. I'm going to start using that. Please do, because step just has such a negative connotation, doesn't it? Like when I was young, like people that had step parents, the step parents were always like the the mean people. I don't know. I never knew good quote unquote happy step parents. So I want that that positive connotation around everything that I touch. So yeah, bonus worked pretty well that way, but. What's it been like to adopt? So you took a, a good hiatus from dating. Like you had a, what, a five, six, seven year, yeah. I don't yes. know, anything to do with men type of deal going on. Right, right. Yeah, no, it was amazing because, yeah, and I'm, I dated people through that time, nothing serious, but I mean, I had interactions with people and things like that. But for me, it's timing is everything. And when his name's Keith, when he came back in my life, now just to give you backstory, we dated in high school. So he was my first love my first everything. So think of everything. He was my first for everything. So yep. he, we were together for four years. I go to college um, and we just grew apart, you know, so we reconnected after 17 years um, and timing, um, timing is everything. So when his family member, one of his cousins came into my gym and said, Hey, you used to date my cousin. I was like, Oh my gosh, you know? And so we connected through text and we set up a uh, we, we met, met for dinner. I thought that we were just going to kind of catch up on life, you know, like maybe meet and, you know, have, have him back in my life as a friend from that dinner. That was a year and a half ago. We've been inseparable ever since. Um, we moved in together after six months of dating and, um, and it's, it's been amazing. Now, obviously he has a little boy. Um, that has been, you know, the, the most challenging part cause I've, I don't have kids, um, but I love kids. Um, but it was, you know, that transition going from like living by myself where it was always quiet and serene and not messy <laughs> to where I'm in the household with two boys and a three, you know, a three-year-old um, who, you know, is a three-year-old, you know? So it was that, that transition was a little bit tough for me, but it's all good. How did it feel? So for me, I'll say giving up my freedom and not freedom in the fact of like going out and doing a bunch of crazy stuff, but the freedom, like when there's a child involved, obviously my schedule is not completely my own. Yes. It's a big adjustment for me from being selfish. Again, I, I had no level of success that you did. I don't even e equate the two to the same, but bodybuilding, that fitness world to me is a very selfish world. Like everything's pretty regimented mm -hmm. and, and that carried over to my business, which carried over to my relationship. Like everything was very self-centered. And then- right you know, have this little girl in my life and a woman that I love. And all of a sudden it's shifting what I feel is important so much so that 
know, now I wouldn't expect you to know this, but I make a point to date my wife one on one every every once a week. I take my daughter out once a week, just her and I. I take the family out once a week. Like it's, I set these all up, these intentions on Sunday, and we communicate so that I know that I'm always present. But until I made that on the forefront of my mind, it was a massive shift to like on a Wednesday night if I want to go out to dinner, Mm -hmm. we couldn't. Like that. How was that? How was that for you? Was it difficult or is it just you know just smooth? Yeah. No, I would say it has. It was not smooth and easy, and that is that is so true because I think that's something that's difficult for a lot of people to talk about. Me, even in my position, um, being a bonus mom, um, you know, it's difficult because um, I. A lot of times, when you're that bonus parent, you can't. Sometimes, you know, it's taboo to talk about certain things or like, oh, you know, that time, oh, that selfishness. And, you know, for me, it was like, you know, I don't get all of Keith all the time. And that's okay. He's he has responsibilities. He's a parent and he is an amazing dad. So I had to kind of let go of the I'm not always going to get all of him, you know, even though like part of me like I want all of you. I, I had to let that go. And I had to be okay with that. And I also had to kind of find my way into their, the family, you know, and transition myself into like, okay, we're a unit versus just two of them. And I'm over here. You know, I found myself a lot of times in the beginning kind of running away. Like, um, whenever we, you know, had Rylan, I found that I would leave or, um, go do my own thing. Or like, I always, okay, well, this is my opportunity to go work. They're, they're here. He has Rylan. I'm going to go work. Um, versus like, being a part of each other's lives and, and, and becoming one unit. So that was the transition for me is like, I always found an excuse to run away. And, you know, when we finally started to really talk about it, I would tell him like, Hey, I don't feel like we're really cohesive and coming together. And then he felt the same way, but also my actions didn't prove for that. I would leave, you know what I mean? Versus like be part of the family or whenever Rylan was acting up, Keith would take him to his room, you know, and versus like us all hanging out to here and, and knowing that, Hey, it's okay. If I, he's a three-year-old, he's going to act up, you know, it's okay for me to see that. So that was the hard balance is like knowing what our roles were, knowing how to handle that when it came up, knowing that, you know, I can't always run away when Rylan came over. I had to, you know, I had to be present for him to kind of create that bond with me. Um, and so that was the tr- learning curve for me. Well, I think, and I'm glad I'm not the only one, Felicia, because I don't know if I've ever spoken about this on air before that, you know, I paint this rosy picture of how life is now, but I'm five and a half, four and a half, five years into this where the first, you know, two or three years, admittedly, I was doing all the same things like forcing myself into work. And we have, I'll say 50, 50, it probably ends up being somewhere around 60, 40 parenting time between, you know, when we have Gianna and when her ex-husband has Gianna. Right. But even then it's, you know, when there were issues or situations, I too was retreating, you know, going to the home office, it's time for me to work or, you know, they have mommy, mommy daughter time and reading books and stories instead of being present. I'm part of that. Yeah. I felt like an outsider, even though right. you know, we're living together, it's our own house together. And it's right. like, right. I just don't think that's really spoken about. Like you said, it's, it's taboo. And I don't think it should be because yeah. I don't know what it's like to have my own child. And I may never know. Yeah. Like, and I, right. I, that can right. be with me, but right. it's just, and you know, it's, it's really crazy because I haven't really talked to a lot of people about this except like my, my mom, obviously. And, you know, I see a counselor every once in a while still just to kind of get those thoughts out. Yeah. But, you know, I didn't really talk about it because, you know, a lot of times that bonus parent, you know, they'll look at is like, well, you know, the kid is the priority. Yes, absolutely. I totally agree. But sometimes you don't know how to maneuver through these relationships. Sometimes you just don't know how to act or react, you know? And so, um, it's a learning process for me just as much as it is Keith. And so, um, I was always afraid to talk about it because I didn't want to be looked at as like, Oh, well, you know, you don't care about the child or, you know, or as a step parent, like you said, it can be looked at as negative connotation when I don't want it to be negative at all. Like we all love each other. We're all going to work through this. I'm so thankful that I came into the picture when Rylan's young. So he's going to grow up with me. Um, and I do, I think about the future and I, I want to be part of their lives. So, you know, I have to make that conscious effort to be that for him and be present. So, yeah. Absolutely. And you've touched base two or three times just in this little snippet of how important and paramount really communications of being with, with a partner. So you and Keith, I mean, you have a phenomenal relationship, like wedding bells can be somewhere in the distant future or maybe not so distant future. It's things that you yeah. shared with me, you've spoken about. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's good. In every one of these little situations where something comes up and it's not familiar for someone like you or I, 
-hmm. instead of my, my old default was to retreat just completely, like go introverted. Like that was the example that was set forth for me from my parents. And that was just what I thought normal was. Mm -hmm. And Lindsay forced me, my wife to, to be more communicative, like to sit down and have these conversations. Right. Right. It it sounds like that's comparable on your side too, right? Like communication ends up being paramount for the success of your relationship. It is absolutely paramount because, Because, you know, again, my old feelings start to come back, the old Felicia sometimes when things aren't perfect. Um, I was so used to just give you backstory. I was used to the toxic relationships, the fighting, breaking up, getting back together, the like animosity. And, you know, Keith is such a even keel, you know, guy like, and I'm so thankful for him because he understands my craziness sometimes, you know, cause I'll be kind of impulsive. I'm an, I'm kind of like that idea person. Like I have all these ideas. I want to run with it. I get excited about things. I can go from here to here in like two seconds. And he's just very even keel. And, um, I love that about him because he keeps me very grounded, but also he doesn't let me run away. You know, he's like, Felicia, you're ridiculous. Come on. You're not going to run away. Let's just talk about this versus like, uh, you know, one of maybe an old partner would be like, fine, then get out. And we both be like fighting back and forth. Whereas Keith's just like, don't leave. Let's talk about this. He's very calm about it. And then I kind of look at it like, okay, why am I overreacting about this? Let's talk about it. And then everything's fine. You know what I mean? So, um, but yeah, I sometimes can feel some of those old habits kind of creep up a little bit. And again, part of me and my growth and self-awareness is, not self-sabotaging a relationship, not running away, not um, creating all of these boundaries, you know, and, and putting my walls up, but, you know, letting the walls down and, you know, knowing that I can trust this person, let's work this out. So. I love it. I love the awareness, the presence of mind and being able to share this. Like there's a, I call it on the show, authentic vulnerability. Like anybody that says they have all this stuff figured out, especially when it's you know, we all have life traumas that have come up. We're all trying to process that and deal with it. We're all in the process of progress of getting to a final destination. Right. In the midst of new traumas coming in, new stimuli coming in, and trying to really maneuver through all this stuff. So, you know, in the social media age, everybody puts their best foot forward. And I get it. We're all marketing a good, a service, a product. Like nobody wants to put their ugly shoes on social media. Right. But we all have ugly shoes in our closet, right? Like, I know if you go to mine, like, sure, I got a bunch of nice new shoes and boxes, but I have some really ugly shoes that have seen some miles too. Yeah, yeah. But in that, as I look at your social media, I don't see a lot of you and Keith. Right. And that, I think there's a stigma that 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 means either that you're single or not happy, and that couldn't be further from the truth. Oh, yeah. I've talked about this before because I firsthand know couples where I see them and I won't call out anybody, but I, I, I see their constant, their photos of each other. And I love this person so much and they're all about each other. But I know the backstory is they are, you know, suffering or they're, they're not, they don't have a good relationship or he's cheating or she's cheating or they're trying to work on this. And, and, you know, whereas I don't necessarily post a lot of pictures of Keith, um, first off, he doesn't have social media. Secondly, he hates taking photos with me because he's always like, no, I don't, you know, I don't look good or he just doesn't the way like like the way he looks and 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 so there's this perception on social media that I'm single so I literally get a lot of messages like oh hey are you are you single now or are you in a relationship and I'm like oh my gosh like you know but I think it's because I put out that perception as well just because I don't post about him a lot Mm -hmm. and um but we are solid on the backside so in my private life with him and I we have an amazing life together an amazing relationship together even though I don't necessarily post a lot about him because on the catch 22 is those couples that always post about each other, not everybody, but a lot. I feel like sometimes they're trying to make up for it or like trying to put out this energy that maybe isn't true or or real. Um, so yeah, but I do get that question quite a bit. Yeah. I think that, I mean, you're the second or third guest I've had on that there can be this overcompensation, especially notably, I mean, you're in the public eye, like your, your, your income, your life is made now based off of a social media footprint. Right. Right just because you're not blasting all this stuff on social media doesn't mean that behind the curtains, everything's in turmoil. It's actually almost mm-hmm. always the exact, exact opposite. I mean, Emily oh. and Andy Purcell, I don't know if you know them or not. I, I don't mm-hmm. drop their name too much, but they have this thing where, you know, they both have set successful businesses. They're, they're both, you know, high level entrepreneurs and they've just made this stance to run in their own lanes. Like that every once, you know, if it's a once every six months and it feels right, they share something. But other than that, it's, you'd scroll through their pages and think they're just, not even one in the same. And it's, yeah, yeah. It's so opposite for, I think, a lot of good, healthy relationships. So, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah, I agree. 
Yeah. So Felicia, if you were to leave the listeners with one impactful message, if you could share one thing that they remember, remember you and remember this episode by, what would that advice be for them? Oh gosh, that's a tough one. Um, because I feel like there's all these different avenues I can go with that. Um, and, uh, if I could leave the listeners with one piece of me, of my advice, of something that, that I am passionate about, I would say, oh, let me see. Um, I put you on the spot. I had to. It's how I wrap up every interview. You did. Oh, my God. Um, honestly, I would, my, my biggest learning lesson for me over the years has been not to compare my life to someone else's highlight reel. Um, because I've been so hard on myself over the years, especially since all the transitions that I've had, like out of, out of bodybuilding fitness, out of the, you know, as much of the fitness modeling world, out of the owning a brick and mortar, I would compare myself to others. Like I wasn't doing enough and I would feel bad about it. Like, what am I not doing? You know, I need to be doing this, this, and this, and everyone else is doing all of these amazing things and I'm not, you know, why is it not happening for me? And that's but that's like so that can just ruin your joy and your your happiness to compare yourself to someone else's highlight reel so for me i would say do not compare to anyone else's life um you know and be grateful and happy in yours and it, honestly that could go a long way and to eliminate expectation and just be grateful where you're at you know because that's another learning lesson in my relationship is not to expect the more I expected Keith to be the certain way, the more I was just let down versus just appreciation of who he is and what our relationship is. So, um, but yeah, that's what I would leave people. That's my own, like, I guess, life lesson. Yeah, I absolutely love it, Felicia. I love the time that you've given me today. Truly yeah. honored to have so many impactful stories and such a, a great guest. Like, thank you. Couldn't be happier to, to share this time and space with you. Thank you so much for being on. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Yeah. So, when you apply the lessons that Felicia shared day over day, you'll find out that you'll consistently get shit done.